Like many other local authorities of the time, Nottingham answered the demand for housing by building upwards and by creating what today everyone admits was the biggest planning blunder of our time. Nottingham, where time is still history, people live in great poverty in their everyday life. Buildings get destroyed, yet they will be demolished to build the great white buildings that scratch the sky. believe that it's more than 40 years since we first met at the flats. Look, the work flats were masonettes. That's right, I remember now. Yeah, we always did call them the masonettes, didn't we? That's right, yeah. The, the term yeah. flats must have crept in after I left, mm -hmm. you know. The reason we've actually chosen to dress like this today was because I think that was a period of time when the um, the fashions had started to change. And very yeah, that's right, yeah. And elderly people yeah. still did dress like this, Yeah, the they? very elderly ones yeah. did. Yeah. And before then, I lived at 25 Beaconsfield Street off Highson Green, well before the masonettes were even thought of. And they were all old buildings with outside toilets and all our kids used to go running around there playing. They were great fun. Yeah. If you think about it, Lynn, everybody used to build bricks. Yeah. It was the first time I'd ever seen huge slabs, huge of slabs being put yeah. into place. Yeah. Just like a big Meccano yeah. set. Slotted yeah? in like Lego All slotted bricks. in, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Mm. And they went up like one oak. It was, it was 1968 when I moved in. Yeah, well, 67 when I moved And um, it felt like yeah, a village. Yeah, it felt like a village, yeah. yeah. I mean, I know that a lot of the people from the flats, they got things on tick oh, on, yeah. on most of the shops. Yeah. You know? Paddy and Ohms were good for that. And you had to... Um, um, you had to know the people fairly well for them to allow you to run a slate up, you know. Um, but I can remember, remember that shop, that, um, the beer off, where we could go and take a jug or a bottle and fill it oh, up? Oh yeah, I used to get mine off Knoll Street, oh. corner of Knoll Street and Berries Road, just oh, across no. the road from Masonettes. On Ice and Green I used to Four go. and threepence it was, used to for get a bottle full. Really rough sherry. Yeah. Well, you could run a slate up there. I didn't, but I know lots of people did. Um, well, you were posh, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> There's only poor people like me who run slates. So. For me, there was five flats built. Mine was the fifth one when the council allotted one for me. Number 18, Cornhill Walk. And it was absolute paradise. We came over to this country in 1965. I say we, it was my two sisters and my mum. Um, I was four and a half at the time. I was the oldest one. I remember more than anything that it was extremely cold. I was very upset and confused because we'd had to leave our father behind. And the reason we'd come over here is basically we'd had to leave Kenya. Um, Kenya got its independence, but because my mother was white, um, and although she was legally married to my father, her life had become more and more restricted and it got to a point where her life was under threat. I would be anywhere between seven and eight, I think, when we moved into the flats. But I do remember when we first, my sisters and I first moved into the flats, we were amazed at how warm it was. There were black tiles, new shiny black tiles on the floor, and they seemed to be warm because the, the old the flat we lived in, you know, was a very cold, it was an old building. 
Um, and there was running water out of the tap. It was the first time that anyone referred to me as regarding my skin and my sisters. And I think we became, became quite conscious that we were quite alone there. I, I think we were, I'm not saying it was definite, but I think we were sort of the first mixed race children on the flat. There wasn't any particular racism on the flats that I remember. I don't remember anyone being marked out. I I'm not saying that you weren't probably called names, but that would be the odd child that was ignorant or the odd individual. But I don't believe there was any issue. But there could, there could have been some people who did. I think we just got on with it. I was living in New Baseford, which was probably about a five minute walk away then. But the flats was always the place that I'd head for straight away, even though by I was told by Mr. Don't go down there, please. But you would, because it was the only place where we got to play, where we felt safe, and there was just lots of things to do, really. Was like I say, where we lived, it was just all terraced houses, back to back, and it was just nothing for us to do but get into trouble, so we just used to go down the flats. There weren't really a lot to play on, but in them days, you just made up your own games, you know, good old game of Dobby or, you know, go and nick a bread crate from the local shops, and down, down the tunnels we'd go, and it was good fun when it was raining because it used to fill up with dirty water. So, you no, know, it wasn't just always something to do. Like, and like I said, I think the main thing for us as kids was just felt safe there. You know, we didn't feel intimidated by anybody or anything. So, yeah, and I think deep down that appearance was, even though we were told not to go down there, we still did, and they knew we were safe down there. Thinking about as you in flats as a child, um, those days were wicked. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a great sense of freedom, a lot of fun, a lot of running around. Um, there's such a tight knit community of, of other people. Not so safe. They, I, I don't know if it's because I had so much family there, but um, I always felt really, really safe. Like. I was well protected. Um, I didn't see any danger apart from the obvious height of the flats and sort of people standing and sitting on walls and sort of falling. Um, yeah, I, you know, the feeling was uh, the feeling as a child was quite secure. There wasn't really much in that way um, of, of parks or things to play on, but we made our own games, you know, Dobby and sort of having races up and down the flats, playing on skates and bikes and things like that. At the age of eight, uh, we moved to Astral Gardens, which was uh, just at the side of the old general pub, which was about 30 seconds walk away from ice cream flats. Uh, I have very good memories of when I lived down there, uh, basically was on the flats all the time. We used to uh, build go-karts, we used to get old pram wheels, uh, years ago there used to be the old silver cross big tram sort of, there was like tanks to push sort of thing and uh, most people in them days really, I look back, didn't really use the prams for pushing babies, they, they used it for taking the washing to the laundrette. Basically in Old Street, uh, if he was going to call one of your friends I'd probably be looking at uh, 1983, 84 and that lot, and you'd be going to call for one of your friends and you couldn't walk from one end of North Street to the other without about six prostitutes sitting there saying, uh, come on loving that lot, you know, come over and see, see me, you know, only five pound, you know, and, and I mean nowadays you'd be running to get <laughs> pay five pound, <laughs> but in them days, you, you know, you, you didn't really know what it was all about and you'd be walk, walking up and uh, one after another big coming out with us, you just say, oh, I can't because my legs are hurting, because, you know, you felt a bit embarrassed and you'd say, and every excuse you said, they'd come back with another one, oh, I'll soon sort that out for you, love. You know, I'll soon put ears on your chest and stuff like that. Yeah, when, when I used to see them out, because there was always up the Knoll Street way and they, they used to be standing out there, and um, I used to ask my mum, why are they there? Because you'd just get used to seeing them going up to school. You'd get used to seeing them quite a lot, and I'd say to them, why are they there? Oh, they're waiting for the ice cream man. OK, waiting for the ice cream man. It's fine. It was, that wasn't all that explanation until it's like six inches of snow, and they're still there. And, you know, when you're a kid, you're my age, you're thinking, well, 
why doesn't you say to them, because they're there every day, why don't you say to them the day before, well, I'll be here at four. So they were out there all day. I can just remember thinking, God, you have to wait there all day for the ice cream man. You know, by the time you get it, do you really still want ice cream? There was loads of brothels on the, on the North Street itself, and you could point out the houses on your way up, which ones were the brothels, because they'd have red lights on that. But I didn't know what a brothel was. In fact, to be honest, I actually thought at one time a brothel was where they went to get skirts and tops. Because I can remember everyone that walked out there, I had a skirt on that looked like a belt had slipped and a top that just shown everything off. It, you, you could see everything. And I remember thinking that's probably what a brothel is. But I think I'd previously got that mixed up with the boutique. I think that's what it was. You know, the brothel, the boutique that cut you out. Because when you're out with your woman, your wife would be at home. Cooking your food, doing your dirt, buddy, what you trying to do? Well, my mother actually moved in in, um, in July 1967. And uh, I moved in about two years later. But I used to go there more or less daily because uh, our cooking facilities, and uh, especially in winter, they had central heating, were better than the ones in the bed sitter had. Didn't like the look of it at first, but it was all modern inside. And uh, after I'd moved there for a bit, I got to love it. Well, it was all this new grey concrete stuff. You know, these big blocks, everybody close together. Boom, I kind of took to it like I think a lot of people did. Well, the people I got to know were okay. Uh, some were a bit funny. I mean, long hair and hippie in, in the 1960s was all brand new. You know, you used to get people calling after you, oh, get your hair cut, and uh, bloody hippies. I never actually went round barefoot. There was too much glass around. <laughs> uh, you step on a little bit of stone, it was uh, painful. Yeah, most people, once you got to know people, and they accepted you, they were okay. But there was a little old lady who lived in the flat below. Uh, she reckoned we made too much noise. And didn't have big stereos in there, they just had a little Dan Zek record player. Which uh, wasn't all that loud anyway. So I played it at full volume. <laughs> I've got to be honest, I've never really been into reggae. I mean, I've heard of Bob Molly and that. It's, some of it can be pleasant. But it's too much uh, thump, thump and bass for my liking. When they had the blues parties at High School Green, they, uh, it was exceedingly loud. A reggae music, it, come make we dance it quick, quick. Um, blues parties were a great release for, you know, a lot of the, uh, uh, the, the Caribbean adults that were like in, uh, living in uh, Ice and Green, Forest Fields, Radford, Baseford, even further afield. People used to come from all over the place because uh, they, they did become infamous. My sister and I used to sneak out the window. I, we had no sense of fear. Sneak out the window and go blues. We were still at school. I was 14, 13, 14. She was younger than me. And we'd be all night at the blues and then sneak back home. Sneak back in and go to school the next day. <laughs> well, sometimes you can tell whether it was somewhere that you lived or whether it was a kind of club. The blues is like a, a late night party gathering um, at somebody's house. Um, you know, you can uh, acquire a drink if you, you need to acquire a drink. And they play music and, um, you know, it's just a nice vibe place. You can go in and kind of chill out and buzz with the vibe. And blues was like the best time for me, especially on Monday night. Um, a lot of people used to have the benefit of what we used to call it, um, uh, what were they called Chris, could it, um, what they used to call it, they used to call it, um, Monday book, that's what they used right. to call it, Monday book, and you yeah. go and, yeah, you remember Monday, Monday book, Monday book, they used to go and cash yeah. your benefit on a Monday, and my cousin used to give me some money on a Monday, she used to borrow money off me, but on a Monday it was a Monday book, so everybody would go to the post office and get the money. Um, Monday nights uh, would be, uh, at that time, in the city, Monday nights was a raving night. 
So people would be at the ad lib and different places like that in the city and then they would sort of head to the flats for the parties and things. And there'd be more than one party going on. And you walk on the, the walk and it'd be like, you know, just buzzing with people and sort of vibes and things going off, you know. The reggae music, you know, thumping down and things. You couldn't just have one a night. No way, because it's like uh, in the flats, it's, it's a flat. How many people can you get in a the flat? They would go to Adlib and then straight from Adlib would go straight to Blues. And as soon as I used to touch ice and green, I used to come alive. And then I'd go up the ramps and straight away you'd hear different music playing and I would just go straight to where Lover's Rock was, which would be Mighty Two. And if I felt a bit like, oh, I've had enough Lover's Rock, I need to go see who else is in Blues, I'd go around the corner and go listen to V Rocket. So we had a lot of choice depending on who was a DJ, so a lot of people followed DJs for whatever music, Lovers Rock, Scar, um, Luby, what was it, um, Raga, depends on what your taste was, so there was different blues and there was a blues on every single night of the week. That one night we got caught, what had happened is one of the guys, and he's quite a well known character in Asterian, so I won't embarrass him, but he knows who he is, um, he'd been in the blues and obviously Oh, I gather that he'd actually had some problems at home, probably because he was sneaking out and his parents had had enough and chucked him out and he was really tired and when he saw us, I remember him saying hello to us that particular night and he must have figured out they'd sneaked out, they would have left the window on the catch, which was the same we used when we used to leave, literally leave the window on the catch. So he wanted a bit of shut eye, so he came back, knew roughly where we lived, got in, climbed in the window, went to bed for a bit and then decided he wanted a wee. <laughs> As he had a wee, of course a man weeing is louder than usually a women weeing because of the echo and my mother shouted out who's that and he stupidly said me, right? And we heard about this later from our mom. He tried to then quickly get himself ready, get out the window. She'd got up by then, was pulling him back in the window to see who it was. So cause we were oblivious to all this, so we come waltzing, you know, back in to, to get back in the house and um, thinking, you know, nothing could happen. And uh, there was my mum at the window watching us go by. We knew we'd got caught, but we didn't know how we got caught. We found out about it, obviously, when we got in, and that put me into our running off to blues in the middle of the night. Yeah. Terrible. <laughs> and it wasn't just a black thing, there was white, there was different ethnicities, weren't there, yeah. just coming for the music. It was quite cramped and it was a bit, I think, I think it was a bit threatening for me with me being white because most of the blues was basically for black black people but, uh, and most of the white people that was there was women normally with black men. But uh, I can't remember really having any, any trouble in that lot. They, they made me feel welcome but I, I, I grew up with a lot of uh, black people. If I was honest, I probably grew up with more black people than I did white. In midweek, it'd be more quieter, so more like the older men and women would go, and there'd be some blues where it'd be like mainly men, and he couldn't really go in there where they'd be gambling, wouldn't they, and playing cards, and he couldn't really go in there. But sometimes we used to go around and just like hang outside, but women couldn't go in certain blues, it was seen as more a man thing. But come Monday, Friday, and Saturday, Blues was kicking. From once clubs had finished at two o'clock, everybody had to the blues. Yeah. You didn't finish till six o'clock, seven o'clock, so yeah. it was all right. I'd run straight home, I'd run straight home, straight into bath, and straight onto my YTS. <laughs> straight <laughs> onto my YTS ski. <laughs> But there were times I actually did go to blues. I actually met the father of my son in a blues. <laughs> At a certain time of night, say about five o'clock, the music starts going nice and slow, smooth starts coming on, and then they start dancing with somebody in the corner, you know what I mean? And then, you know, many, many, many of the younger generation came from blues days because people got together, you know what I mean? Got together, yeah, got together, you know. Form relationships and yeah. went on, and a lot of people from out of town ended up staying in Nottingham because yes. in the 80s our city was on the map for music. Yeah, it's fine, right? Even if he was going through whatever, poverty, 
no money, whatever. As soon as you got to blues, it was it's just like story. one love, wasn't it? Different story. Just one love. And you made a point about that, there was no trouble. Which there wasn't, because you know like you saying, you go to one blues and you might have seen somebody in there who you like, you know, a little bit of disagreement with and you go somewhere else, that person's not going to follow you mm -hmm. like it is nowadays, you know what I mean? You just never seem to get no trouble, they didn't want no trouble, you didn't want no trouble, everybody's just out for a good time, yeah. you know what I mean? So, you know, it was a, it was a good time sometimes. And I remember going to Blues and I'm not a drinker and I remember like the older men like saying, oh, do you want some pop? And I remember having Coca-Cola out of a bottle and I was like, oh yeah, this is it, the, you know, the old fashioned Coca-Cola bottle. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, having my Coca-Cola and I was like, yeah. And then skank it to the music, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm not saying it, I think because it was, a, you could be anonymous in there, couldn't you? I'm little, I was young, I was like 13. By rights, I should have been perved on, paedophiles should have took me away. And instead, I found that um, strangers would be protecting me because like, a guy would be having his eye on me, knowing I'm on me and waiting for, to see what I'm going to do for the rest of the night, if I'm just gonna stay there. But then somebody's watching him, watching me. And so when I'm ready to make a move and this guy follows me, you'll find someone else who's following me. And then someone will say to me, I know your dad. I don't think you should be here. I'm going to take you somewhere safe, kind of. High school in general got a bad name for itself, mainly because of the flats. And I think it was unjustified. I mean, as I got older, I'd have, I think I'd have my first daughter. 